thank you so much, Dr. Maria. It was a pleasure when you and Dr. Raja Sekharan invited me to give this prestigious ICON meeting lecture, the eponymous lecture, named after the stalwart Dr. A.K. Saha. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sanjay Chaturvedi, organizing secretary, for all his help with the arrangements to get here. As you know, and especially those who reside in India, that Dr. Amulya Kumar Saha, 1913 to 1994, was an outstanding orthopedic surgeon, clinician, and scientist of his times. He received his degree in medicine from R.G. Carr Medical College, Calcutta. He was in the British Indian Army in the Second World War as a surgical specialist with a fellowship of Royal College of Surgeons of London and Edinburgh a long time ago. He then returned to India and became professor and head of the Department of Surgery at the University of Calcutta from 1955 to 1963. As you can see, his works, his honors, his interests are boundless. He was a Hunterian professor of Royal College of Surgeons England, founder member of orthopedic section of ASI, president of IAO back in 1969, and emeritus member of SICOT, a fellow of World Orthopedic Concern, innovator, scientist, teacher, who popularized orthopedic surgery amongst young upcoming surgeons. He authored and published extensively innumerable book chapters and articles in prestigious national and international orthopedic journals. His special interests were investigations and understanding of the shoulder mechanism, surgery in post-polio residual paralysis, and spinal surgery. Dr. Saha conducted extensive studies on the functional anatomy of the shoulder joint from anatomic, anthropologic, morphologic, radiologic, and electromyographic as well as mathematical points of view. His paper as cited here on zero position of glenohumeral joint, its recognition and clinical importance was incorporated in clinical orthopedic and related research in 1983 as a classic study. This is the hospital where I work. We have waited at HSS, Hospital for Special Surgery, only doing orthopedics, musculoskeletal, nothing else have just submitted our work on shoulder pathology to the AJSM Sports Medicine Journal and the AOSSM Awards Committee entitled The Bicipital Tunnel, Expanding Our Understanding of Biceps Tail uh, Tendinitis and Associated Pathology, submitted by our fellow Taylor and senior author O'Brien. This is an anatomic and histologic evaluation of a newly recognized and clinical relevant entity, and I hope to report back to you that the article has been uh, accepted, and hopefully we'll receive the award because I think it's groundbreaking a bit of work that we have done. Now coming to Hospital for Special Surgery, we at the moment have 85 orthopedic surgeons. We do about 25,000 surgical procedures a year. 8,000 joint replacements a year, primarily hips and knees, but anything, ankle, elbow, shoulder, and about 300,000 patient visits. You don't, this distinguished audience does not need the definition of arthroplasty, but it is a surgery to deal with pain, disability of an arthritic joint, whether it's osteoarthritis, degenerative, or inflammatory arthritis, such as RA, psoriasis, etc. Foreign materials have been introduced by orthopedic surgeons for a long time in human body for damage and from inflammation. And I would just like to show you very quickly, pictorially, what it all looks like. Here is the Gore-Tex. And you can see that there are these thread-like uh, spaces with lined by foreign body giant cells. So again, the body is reacting against this foreign material that has, that has been introduced hydrogenically. Colograph, ligamentous reconstruction that you do all the time. And here, microscopically, it looks like this. You see this eosinophilic material, acellular. Again, a lot of foreign body giant cell reaction. Bone wax for stoppage of bleeding. This is a regular hematoxin eosin slide. You see that there is this amorphous acellular material. When you polarize it, this is what bone wax looks like. And finally, I want to show you injection of SynVisc supplement. 
It is really, I, I don't know what's happening here, but in uh, my country, in United States, uh, this is being injected too frequently. And as I speak, we are about to start a major project to study the various forms of viscous su supplements because the surgeon and the pain, uh, pain management people think that this is very innocuous. You should give one, two, three injections every one or two months, one or two weeks. But I think it is causing tremendous havoc. And here I would like to demonstrate to you histologically that here is this amorphous material, this blue acellular material, but see the tremendous amount of foreign body giant cell reaction, chronic inflammation. And in fact, just recently, I saw a case not only just involving the synovium, but it was in the bone marrow. So we have talked to one or two companies. We are pulling out all our cases. I have collected about 100 cases in the last two years where it has been documented pathologically that it evokes so much of uh, response. And we are going to look at this and hopefully do a scientific publication. So as we know, the joint prosthesis, usually in the large joints, metal on the convex side and high density polyethylene on the concave side, you use polymethyl methacrylate. Uh, as a fixator, now instead of barium sulfate, a lot of it has been replaced by zirconium. And now, as all of you here also, must be using non-cemented porous metallic prosthesis to promote ingrowth of bone and fibrous tissue. The cause of failure of prosthetic implant, I think you surgeons know quite well. So this is just a schematic drawing. But just to put it very simply, uh, you get implant wear that res is resulted into particulate debris resulting into osteolysis and failure like in this region up here. The materials used as you very well know are cross-linked polyethylene, metallic alloys, ceramic like about 10 years ago metal on metal and ceramic on ceramic. So what is pathology of revision arthroplasty? This is study of the retrieved bone and soft tissue. To demonstrate the extent and amount of implant debris, its size, shape, and surface characteristics, its tissue response, whether it's histiocytic, foreign body giant cells, or plasma cells, and finally, also to include cytologic and toxic effects in the soft tissue and metal ions in blood. What are the complications of joint replacement? You well know that it could be aseptic loosening or osteolysis, infection, hypersensitivity reactions such as lymphadenopathy, autoimmune or delayed response, development of a pseudotumor, which could be because of accumulation of polyethylene and cement debris, resulting in a space occupying lesion or a pseudotumor, and finally, question mark, tumor development status post implant. Here is a case of aseptic loosening with osteolysis, I think you know better than me as a radiologist or as an, uh, a surgeon. Here is the case of osteolysis. This is what a cemented prosthesis looks like. We retrieve these specimens and look at them grossly as well as microscopically. So here you see that there is cement here. It has a shaggy appearance to it. And we split this prosthesis area to show you the bed of the cement and bone. And then the, this one, of course, is metal. Uh, femoral head and stem and a plastic uh, acetabular component. And the non-cemented, I don't know how many of you look at these things carefully, but here you see in the non-cemented, this porosity was one of the factors that it was started to be used so that there was ingrowth. So this is the bone that is growing into it. This is on scan ele scanning electron microscopy where you see the stem. And these are these balls that you see so that in between you see that there is growth of bone and so for some time this was very popular. This is to show you a cemented prosthesis where you have this uh, stem, cement around it and when you take off the sleeve of cement you see that there is a cavitation. This is cement sitting outside. And finally here is a cross section, hematoxyl eosin to show you this smooth fibrous lining then there is a bit of reactive tissue with plasma cells, lymphocytes, and finally reactive bone formation. So bone, and this is the zone where the loosening is taking place. Very quickly, I want to draw your attention, and I don't know how many of you see your cases microscopically or even grossly. 
Here you see that this field of hematoxylin eosin soft tissue is very eosinophilic, very cellular. There are gaps, there are holes in it. Again over here, it seems to contain some amorphous material. You look here, there are long bits of shards of something sitting in this space. And finally here, you see that there is a cystic space containing this barium sulfate foreign body giant cell reaction and pink large histiocytes evoking a tremendous cellular reaction to this material that you have brought into this person's uh, joint. This is scanning electron microscopy, may be too much basic pathology, but I just can't resist. I have to show you that we do all these things, they are not exotic, they are a matter of routine at my institution. So we do scan electron microscopy and then we finally look at the histologic section of this cement and here you see that there are these balls of cement with foreign body giant cell reaction. Moving on to polyethylene, you are quite well uh, learned about the acetabra cup, then the polyethylene insert, the metal femoral head and the femoral stem. Every implant that is re uh, removed at our institution has to by law be submitted to the Department of Pathology. We examine it for burnishing, erosion, etc. And then it is submitted to the Department of Biomechanics, which as you know, is a leading uh, department in making custom processes and trying to learn all the time how can we improve a particular prosthesis. Very quickly to show you the wear damage, this is a good uh, polyethylene tibial insert taken out from the package. And as you see, you can move, and these are the words that we use, scratching, burnishing, pitting, and delamination. And again, the wear debris then causes, it gets ingested, releasing cytokines, osteoclastic recruitment to remove this debris, and finally resulting in bone destruction. So, as a surgeon, the patient comes to you, your colleague, the rheumatologist, or the clinician, says that is a swollen knee, what do we do? So they go in, they aspirate this, and you see this turbid fluid, and you think, is this infection, or is this polyethylene debris? So we as pathologists then spin it, and we put it out a drop on a glass slide, and here we see this muck, if you will, and this certainly does not look like infection, it's not polymorphonuclear or it's not chronic inflammation. And when you polarize it, you see that it's in fact all implant debris, confirming that it was implant material and not infection. And thereby, we help you to decide what to do next. This is a very um, beautiful slide of a synovium. And we do frozen sections at the time that you're operating for determining whether the patient has infection or not and thereby helping you to continue your with or without your surgery. So here's a bit of a synovium and you see that it's not frond-like like fern but it is very nodular. It has focal areas of yellow discoloration with areas of hemorrhagic discoloration. Could this be PVNS? But no, it's not pigmented villonodular synovitis. And when you take sections from this specimen, you see a variety of reactions. Here you see that there are lots of histiocytes, giant cells, and I don't know if there are some junior people who could recognize what this is. Can anybody say something? This is an asteroid body. And technically, when we were in medical school, an asteroid body was supposed to be the hallmark of sarcoidosis. But we now find that this is a non-specific uh, development and it can occur and this case actually is just loaded with small and large shards of polyethylene and when you polarize this on light microscopy you see it like this but when you polarize it you see that there are big and small pieces of polyethylene that have just rapidly been engulfed by this patient's <coughs> giant cells and histiocytes, this patient had loosening within three months of implantation. Moving on to metal, this was a case that we received recently, and here you see that again the femoral head, it's completely burnished, eroded in this region, and here you see the synovium looks very different from what I just showed you. It's absolutely black. It's not gray black or red brown as you would see in hemorrhage, such as post-traumatic hemophilia, hemochromatosis, but this is a characteristic appearance of what we see in patients with metal um, implants and particularly titanium, not so much so with cobalt chrome stainless steel, but with titanium. And um, 
My colleagues and I were the first to report this titanium shedding in 1987, Egan's et al. at Hospital for Special Surgery, because till then, artifact in the lab, but in fact, this is what metal looks like on microscopy. And furthermore, you see that it involves not only the soft tissues, you polarize it, it's dot-like as opposed to those linear shards, fibers of polyethylene. And in fact, this is a section of bone, cartilage, and trabecular. And you see that it also has a propensity to infiltrate because it's an inflammatory response to this foreign material. And a higher magnification to demonstrate clearly that these macrophages have engulfed these particles of metal this is on electron microscopy, how it appears like little Chinese crosses in the endoplasmic reticulum. And to confirm that we were talking sense and not uh, just imagining, we did this uh, special energy dispersive analysis of x-rays, whereby we, did, we demonstrated a peak in the titanium. This has become a routine for us, and now we are quite uh, uh, confident when we make this diagnosis. However, every July, when our new residents come in, we have a new few small um, junior attendings, they panic and they start sending frozen one after the other, typically around six, seven, eight at night and we tell them, oh, read our book and you won't do this to us. It's not infection. Moving on to alumina ceramic, then came the phase of the ceramic and you see that this was the coating, but it has been completely denuded so that it exposes the underlying metal here is just to show you some variations, a bit of an impingement in this region resulting in this denudation or removal of the ceramic coating. And here is just in situ. And this is what alumina looks like on microscopy. You can see that there is a tremendous amount of foreign body giant cell reaction, almost looking like a vasculitis. And here is the corrosion product. So then it was thought that maybe we should change this and People introduced zirconia in 1980, but this is what that looks like also, and you can see that it's tremendous of shedding of this punctate, gray, blue, discolored material. We then started looking at lymph nodes, and we found that there were some cases, thank God only a few, that there was systemic lymph adenopathy. And here are cross sections of the lymph nodes. They have this reddish brown discoloration. Microscopically, here you see the germinal center, surrounded by the lymphocytes and when polarized we could even demonstrate little pinpoint fragments of both polyethylene and metal. So there are a few cases. I have been at hospital for special surgery practicing orthopedic pathology for 30 years and uh, you know tremendous amount of material but fortunately we don't see this lymphadenopathy and as I will talk about Alval, I keep repeatedly asking the surgeon why don't you submit us some lymph nodes but they feel that the lymph adenopathy that happens is just hyperplasia. So finally, we come to this hot topic of delayed hypersensitivity reaction in metal on metal prosthesis. Alval, which is a misnomer, it's an aseptic lymphocytic vasculitis. There is no vasculitis associated lesion, but the name is stuck for, a, uh, for some time. And here I was just discussing, and I have been here to India over the past two years, three years, and I have been exposed to almost 2,000 surgeons. And I'm a little uh, disappointed that the materials are not being sent for examination, which is mandatory in the United States, because you will get a wealth of information to move forward. And I would like to make it a point, this medical tourism has brought many Americans here to be operated over, all over the country. And of recent, we have seen five cases that have come back from here, four years, three years, two years, who have developed this alval, but there was no uh, uh, discussion with the or original surgeon. So uh, in this alval, total hip replacement, metal on metal, this is what it looks like. You need no introduction. Then there is the surface replacement. We had a Chinese surgeon, uh, and he's well recognized in world literature, Dr. Su who was gung-ho about this uh, surface replacement till of late, about one and a half years ago, when we also got more knowledgeable in what we were doing, reading the literature and seeing more and more of these cases that this also seems to not be such a good idea. So I want to show you, even though you are not pathologists, but I would like to encourage that you send all your materials for the reasons that I'm going to show you in the next few slides. So here is a classic appearance of Alval. You see this thick membrane-like material. 
So in this region, and I'm going to show you higher magnifications, this is pink eosinophilic necrotic tissue mixed with fibrin. As you move down, you see that there is more blue element to it, and further down when you move here, you see a lot of blue cells. Higher magnification, moving from the top to the bottom, you see that there is this fibrinous exudate, necrotic cells. As you come here, you see that there are lymphocytes intermixed with blood. Higher magnification to show you that these lymphocytes carry something in it. And finally, you see that these lymph uh, histiocytes have this globular pale structures within it. And these are all the metallic corrosion products that are resulting in this hypersensitivity reaction alveol. Now, over the past four years, we are four pathologists, including the chairman. We have collected close to 200 cases at our institution, and we have uh, analyzed these. We are still sitting on it, as you know, in the New York Times front page. The, about two weeks ago, Johnson & Johnson is scared out of its wits because of this just the surface replacement, $4 billion suit and many more to come. So uh, in summary, the histological scoring criteria of Alval is this. Uh, I don't have time to go over it, but if anybody is interested, we can talk about it. Also, at my institution, we do a tremendous amount of immunoperoxidase, immunologic studies of trying to identify B cells and T cells and giving it a score so that if it's a score of 8 to 10, the patient definitely has severe immunologic hypersensitivity reaction, and you better look for something else. So the changes in the design started around 2004. All the major manufacturers introduced similar modifications to the implants. They tried to make larger heads, reducing the dislocation, shorter trunnion connections, redu reducing in reduction in impingement, adding metallic adapters of different shape, cylindrical or circular trapezoidal, and removal of the trunnions with a variety of angles. This is my colleague who is a crazy Italian, but I'm very grateful to him because he stays from 7 in the morning till midnight. My hours are much shorter, about 10. And here you see that there is a tremendous uh, permutation combination of shape, size, trunnion, and material. So I don't know where we are going. But if you don't examine the histology, how would you know what really is happening? So in resurfacing, you know that the materials involved are metals, cement, corrosion products, total hip replacements, metals, polyethylene, ceramic, hydroxyapatite, and corrosion products. We tried to study the blood vessel levels of metallic ions. It was not so good. It was hypersensitive, small particles, but beyond that, it didn't really give us a good correlation lot of expense. So yes, this looks like a very busy slide, but we have a schematic way of looking at it very systematically. We get the fresh tissue, we keep some for frozen section, we take for electron microscopy, then we put it in formal in fixation the usual way, and we go through all this slew of doing light microscopy, immunoproxidase, immunologic studies, uh, in fact, going all the way to fish, laser, capture and mass spectroscopy. Now, I don't expect you to do all of it, but uh, as I have spoken to Dr. Maria and to Dr. Raja Sekran and many others, Dr. Sanjeti, Dr. Um, uh, many other very eminent orthopedic surgeons, we would love to do collaborative work. And uh, India is my country. I would even volunteer to say on behalf of my chairman, Dr. Michael Klein, that some of it in the initial phases we could even absorb the cost, but you need to send us the material and we'd be happy to work with you on any of these things. Very quickly, just to show you silicon, which I don't know if it's being used here or not, and of course in the United States also it's not. You see that there is a big cystic space, silastic introduction, and here you see the removed implant in a case of rheumatoid arthritis. And here you see that there is a tremendous amount of foreign body giant cell reaction, very different to this material which has a buff appearance to it. It does not polarize, and this, in fact, is silicon. Again, in the bone, you see the same kind of appearance, buff colored material, foreign body giant cell reaction, reactive bone formation, electron microscopy, and finally, again, the EDAX to demonstrate a peak in silica ruling out everything else. Let's talk about infections, another complication around joints, 
uh, total joints. We get these all the time because we primarily get a lot, we are the tertiary center. So we get a lot of patients from outside and uh, just from my point of view, um, you, can, you must send cultures and don't just put a swab and send it in the broth and send it back. Send actual tissue from wherever you are suspecting. So we do microbiology, we do a frozen section, we do permanent sections and we put it all together for you to tell you whether there is infection or not. Again, same tube you may say, yes, but do we know is this implant debris or is this infection? And in this particular case, when you smeared out the fluid, you see that it, in fact, it is very cellular, necrotic material, fibrin, blood, and these are all acute polymorphonuclear cells confirming that this time it is infection. This is a gross photomicrograph of a knee. You see the extrusion of the cement and very yellow looking pussy kind of material made smears, made slides and confirm the diagnosis that it's in acute infection and thereby stopping your surgery, waiting for six weeks of antibiotics and then moving on. Now, the next topic is pseudotumor, which results in a large lytic lesion due to the accumulation of polyethylene and cement. Here is a cross section of the gross. You see the acetabular roof. You see that there is this huge lesion right here. On sectioning and doing H&E, you see that it is a cystic space filled in with this amorphous material. And that was a case of pseudotumor. Then here is a case of autoimmune reaction. I'm going to rush through this. I presented this at the International Skeletal Society in Washington, D.C. three years ago. Here was a case of a patellofemoral prosthesis with malalignment. Section showed that there was this cystic spaces filled with material in it, foreign body giant cells, asteroid bodies, polarized microscopy showed that it was implant material. So we were very happy and said, okay, fine, this is implant reaction, nothing more. One month post revision, you saw this little bit of erosions here and seven months later, you saw that there was marked erosions at the periphery. MRI at seven months post revision showed that actually the pathology had exceeded. And when a section was taken from that synovium, we saw that there were these huge areas of granulomatous reaction, lymphocytes all around. Here you see that there are giant cells with C uh, cells around the periphery, a nice granuloma in this region and some more over there. So the question was, there's an enlargement of the lymph node. They took it to Memorial Sloan Kettering thinking that this patient had developed lymphoma when in fact these were all non-necrotizing granulomas consistent with sarcoidosis. So the question is, is this sarcoidosis induced by the wear debris or from a failed knee prosthesis or was there unrecognized underlying sarcoidosis that caused sarcoid-like granulomas around particle debris? So this was not a typical case, but it was chicken or the egg, and we till today don't know what came first. The late complication, finally, could be development of malignant tumors, primary or secondary to implant. And here you see, this was a, about a 58-year-old woman who had run-of-the-mill osteoarthritis. You can see she had an implant. And a few years later, she complained of pain in a suburban hospital, and uh, the radiologist said, oh, it's nothing. He did an MRI, uh, sorry, he did a plain X-ray and a CT scan, and he said, nothing, go home. The treating physician said, take NSAIDs, and you'll be all right, and you put your leg up here and there, and it'll be fine. Finally, she was not satisfied. The pain became excruciating, and she uh, reported to hospital for special surgery to our tumor surgeon. And when he took an X-ray, he saw that this implant was well in position, there was no loosening, but there were these typical radiation spicules radiating from this, making the diagnosis of osteogenic sarcoma. The tumor was removed at our institution. I took a photograph of the specimen, and you can see that the cortex disappears towards the femoral head. It's completely destroyed. It's replaced by this tumor mass that has a yellow, gray, blue, red hemorrhagic areas with spicules characteristic of uh, radiation, uh, radiating spicules, as you see in osteogenic sarcoma. This was a fixed specimen, and then we also do specimen radiographs, again, to show you the speculation, uh, sunburst appearance, 
And finally, microscopically, I think you can recognize also these trabeculae have a stucco appearance of osteoid production, higher magnification to show you that in fact, this was all osteoid like here. So host bone, tumor bone and very cellular malignant cells making this a diagnosis of osteogenic sarcoma in a case of uh, status post implant. We published this case, but again, we could not document whether this was what came first. So in conclusion, the study of retrieved material from revision arthroplasties is helpful in determining the cause of failure, finding better materials for future implants with greater longevity and fewer complications, both at the pathological level as well as biomechanics. And so I would like to end this lecture by saying that all retrieved tissue must be sent for histopathological evaluation for you as a surgeon to go forward. Maybe I'm using big words, but we feel very strongly on this issue. And I hope that my lecture has uh, shown you that reason why you should send this material. These are a whole lot of references. This is the Hospital for Special Surgery. This is my faculty, and we work very closely with the Department of Radiology and Biomechanics. Here is the asteroid body, the sin bisque, and finally, thank you. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Dr. Bansal. That was really a current hot topic, and I think the importance cannot be overemphasized. And I do wish that this message goes far, that pathology has to be studied, because we have not yet found a perfect implant which can be put in without fear. I mean, I worry if I have to have an implant because I don't know which one. Yes. Thank you so much. We are very grateful for you having come all the way from U.S., hospital from special surgery. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.